friends, a very warm welcome to you this evening for our second Daya Krishna Memorial Lecture. I welcome you on behalf of the Raza Foundation, which as you know is a trust created by our great master Sayyid Hadar Raza. And uh, among many things, we do organize a series of annual memorial lectures. They are named after V.S. Gayatonde, Kumar Gandhar, Habib Tanbir, Mani Kaul, Daya Krishna, Agge, and Keluchan Mahapatra. And uh, the annual series is being, in a sense, launched today with um, the foundation does a lot of things. For instance, even next month we have a poetry, re we are starting a new series all in IIC called Kavita Ki Ek Sham, which will be on the 8th of August, to be followed by another, in fact, 22nd installment of Art Matters on 13th, with major departures in arts of our time, Arundhati Subramanyam, Abhay Sardesai, and Anuradha Kapoor. We have started a journal called Swaramudra, which is in Hindi devoted to classical music and classical dance and luckily and coincidentally a very important book on music in Hindi written by Mukund Lat has come out and we are having a um, discussion on that book along with a discussion with Dr. Mukund Lat himself and this will be on the 23rd of August. On the 11th September, it would be 50 years of Mukti Bodh's death. It would also be 50 years of the publication of his first book of poems posthumously, and also the publication of a great classical poem that he wrote called Andherine. So we are having a big seminar on that on the 11th of September. Also, on 20th September, we have the Kumar Gandhar Memorial Lecture to be delivered by the well-known Karnatak singer T.M. Krishna, to be followed in October by Manikor Memorial Lecture to be given by Professor Rashmi Dorai Swami, to be followed in November by the Agge Memorial Lecture to be given by Professor Hiren Gohai of uh, Guwahati to be followed by Habib Tanvir Memorial Lecture to be given by Professor Navjot Singh. Uh, so there we are trying to do things uh, to the extent possible and we are very happy to have uh, Professor Patat Bhanu Mehta who is the President of the Center for Policy Research New Delhi. He has taught political theory at Harvard, JNU, and U, U Law School. And he has a PhD in politics from Princeton. He is the recipient of the prestigious Infosys Prize Award, the Amart Sen Prize, and the Malcolm Adesha Award for distinguished contribution to the social sciences. He has published extensively in several fields. Uh, papers in political theory, constitutional law, intellectual history, politics and society in India. His books include The Burden of Democracy and three co-edited volumes, India's Public Institutions, The Oxford Companion to Politics in India and Shaping the World, India and Multilateralism. His forthcoming work includes The Oxford Companion to Constitutional Law in India, a book on rethinking Indian intellectual history. He's also done extensive public policy work, as all of us 
uh, who are engaged in, in watching what's happening to us, especially in the socio-political field, would know. He is one. He has been on the uh, National Security Advisory Board. He was a member convener of the Prime Minister's National <coughs> Knowledge Commission. He writes in Indian Express, which is one of the best columns being written uh, in any newspaper, as far as I know. And when I approached him, I've been trying to net him in for a while, and he used to either sometimes go away to Harvard or wherever, and couldn't get him. But when I finally approached him for this and he agreed, I did not know that he knew their Krishna well. In fact, as he says, he grew in the shadow of Dr. Daya Krishna. Now, Dr. Daya Krishna, and when I was a young aspiring poet in Hindi, in Sagar, uh, Dr. Daya Krishna was a young teacher of philosophy. And he was one of those people on the campus who were sensitive to our new initiatives in poetry. Unlike Acharya Nandulari Vajpayee, who was the doyen and who was, we thought, deeply opposed to us. So he, he became, the action became a center of many of us younger people hovering around him. After the Krishna, if one may recall, was a person who, was, who used to play with ideas. For him, I always think the word vichar vinod will be the most appropriate. He used to play with ideas. He's a very inquisitive mind. He's question everything. Actually, I was very surprised later with the development of him uh, when I learned that he had organized a dialogue between Sanskrit scholars, Persian scholars, and so-called modern scholars uh, making uh, thematic propositions which were taken from Bertrand Russell. And the book is, and he was deeply interested in all that. And he was one of the few, I don't know whether philosophers are called social scientists or not. Uh, perhaps they are, or perhaps they are not. Uh, but here was a philosopher who was deeply interested in literature and the arts. And whenever he came here, we used to have a <coughs> sort of evenings of discussion at the bar uh, with Nirmal Verma and other kinds of people joining in. And Dr. Daya Krishna used to be always holding forth. And there was nothing which escaped his curiosity and his, his interrogative mind. So we thought uh, that here was one of the top philosophers of India who died and we should do something in his memory. So that's how we instituted this annual lecture. The first lecture was delivered by Ananya Vajpayee uh, last year, who unfortunately seemed to be taken to be my daughter. <laughs> and every, every now and then I have to clarify to many people that much as I would like to have such an <laughs> person as my daughter. She is not my daughter. Uh, it is Kailash Vajpayee's daughter who is another poet. But anyway, um, and now is we have Prasad Bhanu Mehta to give us uh, the lecture. But before he does so, may I present him with a bouquet of flowers. This is a truly intimidating occasion for me uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, because of the person sitting on my left and who, who knows so much about uh, Indian traditions and cultures, and I'm going to venture on some of his territory uh, with a little bit of presumptuousness uh, for several people in the audience um, who have been inspirations. Um, but also because of, um, let me put it this way, my personal relationship with Dayaji, which is a very odd one. Uh, I knew Dayaji as a child. I grew up on Rajasthan University campus. Uh, and Dayaji was, still remains actually to me, uh, if I ever try and picture 
what a professor looks like and should be like. I think Dayaji epitomizes that more than almost anybody else I've ever seen in any university in any, in any part of the world. Uh, and I think that was too, true for two reasons. Uh, one, and I think it is worth reiterating in our context, uh, he was somebody who believed genuinely in the idea that the primary purpose of the university is the cultivation of the intellect. And if it ever deviates from that mandate, it is no longer a university. The roles and responsibilities of professors follow from that obligation. When we claim autonomy, and, 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 and he was an extraordinary figure uh, in, in terms of the dignity with which he, he carried the idea of a professoriate with him. I think the second thing, uh, as Ashokji sort of said, you know, is not just his attraction for Vichar Vinod, but I think he epitomized something I'm very sympathetic to, which is that there is nothing better in life than a good seminar. And, and Dayaji could do it day after day after day. Uh, his curiosity was inexhaustible, uh, but also his democratic openness. Uh, my dreaded moment during most of the days used to be as a 13, 14 year old riding a bicycle to the you know, Rajasthan University guest house. And Dayaji in his white kurta would be out on his sort of evening walk, white kurta, occasionally a black umbrella. And he would almost always stop and ask you a question of some kind. And you would very intimately say, Uncle, I don't know anything, Uncle, I don't know. And, and, and his reply would be, it's precisely because you don't know anything that your questions will be more interesting. And I'm actually uh, sort of narrating this incident in part because as I was thinking of what to speak about today, uh, I decided to take his advice in a sense, speak on the, from the ground of my ignorance rather than from the ground of my strengths. Uh, you know, a little bit about political science, perhaps something about contemporary politics. Um, uh, in some past life, I knew some philosophy and political theory, but I moved a bit far away from them. But I thought this would be a very good occasion uh, to sort of enter into a conversation with Dayaji as we now know him, or Dayanka as we used to know him, uh, used to know him then. On a particular theme that actually became very important to him in his life, um, in his intellectual life. And I think this was the one theme that strangely enough, I think went beyond Vichar Vinod. Uh, he was a gadfly, he liked to provoke. I think some of, he was, he was the most sort of, one of the most brilliant destructive intelligences uh, Indian academic philosophy has seen. If you, if you ever wanted to take an argument apart, just, just talk to Dayaji. But I think at some point in his life, he developed a serious interest in this whole question of why is Indian philosophy not taken seriously. He himself was a very late convert to that idea. Uh, I mean, I distinctly remember uh, uh, as, as a child, and Dayaji would always kind of rope us into, you know, various kinds of, come join this discussion group, so you just, you know, you go and hear him out. He was actually quite skeptical of the claims of so-called Indian philosophy. Um, most of his early work, as many of you know, uh, was in the analytical tradition. Uh, uh, his early articles actually in the philosophy of science, artificial intelligence in British Journal of Philosophy of Science. Um, and he slowly moved into <coughs> Indian philosophy, I think partly perhaps guided by or with a, in a dialogue with Mukundlath, uh, 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 who was in a sense, in a sense, the kind of uh, um, sort of Holmes to Watson kind of thing on this issue. And the move to Indian philosophy initially was, I think, guided by two concerns, which are very understandable and very, you might say, almost kind of prosaic. One was, of course, just a realization that uh, he did not know as much about Indian philosophy as he thought. And the more he learned about it, uh, the more he realized what possibilities inhered in, 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 in that tradition. And that was the context in which he started this absolutely extraordinary series uh, called Sambad, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later on, uh, where the idea was to do a genuine philosophical dialogue. This is not comparative philosophy. 
this is not history of philosophy it is an actual genuine philosophical dialogue between different traditions and the model was you take a concrete proposition you know russell's theory of the proposition and then see how philosophers uh, from different traditions react to that particular claim philosophically right from 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 their own perspective and it was an extraordinarily successful series but i think it was one of the great intellectual tragedies of our time that it's hard to imagine that kind of dialogue happening now it's so hard to imagine it at both ends of the spectrum i think i think what he managed to capture in those dialogues was really last of the generation on both sides that was capable of engaging in that dialogue uh, analytical philosophers who were deeply trained in indian philosophy who had enough knowledge of sanskrit to be at least able to talk to sanskrit interlocutors on the one hand uh, and sanskrit interlocutors who were in a sense genuine philosophers in their own right rather than merely in a sense historians of philosophy and and it's hard to imagine us being able to recreate the academic milieu out of which on the one hand people like dayaji and arindam and uh um, jain monti came on the other hand badrina shukla uh, came uh so i think it was a last kind of attempt to really expand the boundaries of that intellectual milieu uh i think the second motivation um uh, was uh, of course he was genuinely interested in new kinds of arguments and very unorthodox kinds of arguments all the most of his work except his i think last book on on the history of uh, 18th and 19th century uh, uh, navnya and logic most of his engagement in with indian philosophy was you might say critical and and deconstructive in nature uh, it was exploring myths about indian philosophy it was expo- exploding classification schemes you know you claim nay fits into this school actually you haven't you thought about that other claim it was that kind of work extremely important because it really lifted the cobwebs of so much so many of the assumptions in indian philosophy but as i reread his work thinking about this and i originally intended to do something else as a lecture but i i revisited some of his work it became clear to me that there was something else going on it was not just this academic curiosity it almost became a passion and an exhortation on his part to say we need to take indian philosophy seriously and that was a very unusual stance for their team he was never he never spoke in an imperative mood do this except when he comes to talking about indian philosophy and it had almost reached a point where you might say he had become a provo- there was a kind of provocative fanaticism about his exhortation to indian philosophy when i was and the last time i had any great interaction in i was still an undergraduate at, at oxford sort of you know learning philosophy and social science from rajiv bhargav i would come home in summers and dayaji would sort of say well, but you know why aren't you reading indian philosophy why aren't you reading uh, sanskrit and it had gotten to the point where you know he once made this notorious remark which has actually spawned a lot of papers where he said you can't even do indian philosophy in english you have to do indian philosophy in sanskrit if you are actually doing indian philosophy and I, that's also a thought i will actually come back to later so what i want to do today in the next few minutes is sort of use dayaji against himself in a way which i hope he would have kind of appreciated to do a kind of cultural reading of his demand that we do it in philosophy I mean, what kind of a demand was that why was he making it what kind of a cultural moment did that represent in the history of ideas uh, 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 in, 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 in india in some sense that he didn't have much patience for modern psychology to be very honest uh, or in a sense reading philosophy culturally uh, 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 i don't think he was a big fan of richard rorty for example uh, um, but i do think his own work uh, bears um, some illumination if you in a sense read it as that cultural moment and So 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 that's what I kind of plan to do sort of what exactly was he after in Indian philosophy and why did that enterprise fail okay and I think I think he would be the first to acknowledge that it was actually a failure in some larger cultural sense the one key to understanding 
how serious that question was for him. And as I said, he was a late convert and therefore had the enthusiast of a late convert. Was he almost, he, he once uh, in, some, in a public lecture used um, an epigraph from Goethe's Faust to talk about the obligation to take Indian philosophy seriously. Um, and he said something like, what you have has, a, uh, the, the, the epigraph goes, what you have ha as a heritage, take now as a task. For this you must make your own. And it's a remarkable statement. What you must, what you have as a heritage, take now as a task, right? At once, both signaling the fact that this was not something that was naturally available to us anymore, right? Our heritage had become our task. And what does it mean to take this heritage, in a sense, as, as a task? Uh, as I said, that is engagement with Indian philosophy to kind of be a bit reductionist about it, came in two phases. There is the early very critical phase where he engages with it but in a largely skeptical deconstructive mode. And one of the classical articles from that period, which, which, which is interesting because it both deconstructs Western myths about Indian philosophy, but also simultaneously constructs Indian myths about Indian philosophy was a, a classic article, one of the most cited articles in the field, Three Myths About Indian Philosophy. And I want to begin with a, with a reading of a small passage in that uh, uh, to, to try and work my way through what I see was, as, as being problematic about kind of Dayaji's engagement with, with this tradition. So one of the myths that Dayaji wanted to explore consistently about Indian philosophy was the claim that Indian philosophy is spiritual. Uh, the kind of classic, at least the way he read it, Western construction of Indian philosophy and what he thought the Indian interest in Indian philosophy, he thought was entirely for the wrong reasons. It was entirely for the wrong reasons because it started with the premise that Indian philosophy was spiritual. And as Dayaji wrote, who has not been told that Indian philosophy is spiritual? Who has not been told uh, that this spirituality is what distinguishes Indian philosophy from Western philosophy, sets it apart and makes it unique. And one of his lifelong passions was not just to deconstruct this myth that Indian philosophy was specifically spiritual, right? that you could not understand it in a context that was anything other than spiritual. Right? That, that was one of his kind of lifelong uh, passions. But he thought that deconstructing this myth was actually central to the task of recovering Indian philosophy. Right? And I want to argue in the next few minutes that perhaps unwittingly he threw the baby out with the bathwater, which is in his insistence that right, you could somehow abstract Indian philosophy from a certain, as it were, spiritual enterprise. What he ended up doing was actually undercutting the entire series of motivations that would lead you to take interest in this in the first place. And the burden of this lecture to is explain how that actually happened. So what did Dayaji mean by spirituality when he says there's a myth that Indian philosophy is spiritual? In his own reading, he does a very interesting sort of the ambiguous play on the term spiritual. In that essay, he basically contrasts spiritual with material, right? So he basically says the claim involves the claim that the nature of ultimate reality is spiritual in nature, and somehow this realm of the spirit is ontologically opposed to, ontologically beyond, different than something called materialism. So what he was trying to explore in the sense, right, was this claim that Indian philosophy doesn't actually take materialism seriously. And then he argues, look, not just the Charvaks, but every system of Indian philosophy actually does take materialism seriously. Now the puzzle I have in reading this claim is it's not clear to me entirely who Dayaji's target was, which is Yes, there is a popular conception, right, that Indian philosophy is purely spiritual. 
But who actually ever denied right, that Indian philosophy was something other than just spiritual or its conception of what, and, 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 and I'll try and explain what I mean by spiritual in a second, was something other than this very bland play. Spirit is something other than matter. Right? Spirit is something private, understood largely, largely, largely negative. Right? Oh. What I think happened, and, 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 and this in, 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 in Indraji's reading of this claim, was he, I think, conflated two senses of the term spiritual. Right? One was, as I said, this ontological sense. Uh, and in his insistence that Indian philosophy was something other than spiritual, right? There's always the risk, as I said, of throwing the baby out with the bath water, right? Which is, uh, Indian philosophy could be spiritual in another, in another sense. It could be spiritual not in the sense that it actually denies the reality of matter. Uh, but it could be spiritual in the sense that, right? Uh, there is a search for a self that is freed from any lim any delimitations, right? That actually matter imposes on a conception of the self, right? Um, if you like, the core of that idea of spirituality is some conception of s or some search for a self that is freed from any limitations, so that it can dilate itself in, as it were, a greater reality and an all-pervasive all, right? In that sense, spirituality doesn't take, as it were, a new view on the denial of matter, right? Or on, as it were, some ontological claim about the material being real, right? It simply is, in a sense, a quest for a state of being that gives you a total vision of reality, right? in which every particular point of view right, gives way to an appreciation of, as it were, the whole. And it's hard to argue that there is any school of Indian philosophy that considered spirit, that, that considered spirit immaterial in this kind of privative sense. Right? In fact, if there is a claim about the spirit, Brahman or whatever in Indian philosophy, that he was somewhat reductionist about these terms in his early, early writings. Right? It is that even matter had to participate in this kind of larger underlying order to be anything at all, right? So it was really in a sense that old philosophical question of what are the grounds of being, right? And it's a curious thing to me that Dayaji didn't take that meaning of spirituality actually as seriously. As, 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 as one would have hoped. It's all the more surprising because if you read another book of his, uh, which is um, the Prolegomena to uh, uh, a History of Civilizations, right, which he wrote for this massive project in the History of Civilizations, there he makes the rather intriguing claim that actually each civilizational identity has to be anchored to some particular question about the nature of the spirit, right? That there is some large question in the shadow of which right, a particular civilizational identity and therefore a particular professional identity unfolds. Right? So if you think about what that might be for the West, it was broadly two things. Right? Uh, in the early phases, it is broadly a philosophical reckoning with the idea that Christ did not come after the prophet had promised that he would come, right? which is uh, which sets off the debate, debate between the Augustinians and the Pelagians. And most of the development of philosophy, right, uh, uh, in a sense post-Christian philosophy, is an attempt one way or other to come to terms with this fact of in what form or whether at all will the kingdom of God be realized. And what does that claim mean? Arguably even Kant and Hegel. You cannot understand without reference to that particular claim about, as it were, the absence of the kingdom of God or the fact that the kingdom of God did not unfold literally. Right? And much of Christian philosophy is, in its, in, its, in, 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 in its theodistical form, an attempt to come to terms with such a claim. Right? The second main 
impetus in, in, in a sense that Western tradition was of course the philosophical impetus provided after the coming of science, right? Which is in a sense philosophy trying to come to terms with the idea that there is a particular conception of physical law at work, right? That philosophy has to in a sense give an account for. And it's actually one of the interesting things and it's a point that Aji makes in, 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 in that book that if you look at quote unquote Indian philosophy of science, that's one problem it's actually not exercised with. Either it's exercised with some kind of axiomatic enfolding, it's science as a kind of deductive enterprise, right? Axiomatic enterprise coming out of Panini, or it's concerned with science as explaining the phenomenon of the particulars, right? Particularly said particular sense experiences and empirical reality in its sort of manifold discreteness. But the idea that there is an independent domain of physical laws that has to be, whose status has to be interpreted philosophically, right? That idea actually is not a very prominent one in Indian philosophy, right? So, Dalji had a very clear sense that animating what we think of as philosophical questions was often a kind of large and deep cultural angst. And I just gave two examples of this, right? Coming to terms with uh, the, what the kingdom of God might mean and how it might be realized uh, as an impetus to metaphysics on the one hand, or coming to terms with this extraordinary phenomenon of physical laws in the form of natural science post, post 15th, 16th centuries and other, right? <coughs> Yet when it came to Indian philosophy, right? What Dayaji wanted to do in his rejection of the claim that Indian philosophy is spiritual was to try and exhort Indian philosophy to a certain kind of worldliness, right? Somehow, on the assumption that if you could show that the Indian philosophy was worldly, not spiritual, in the sense that he articulated in that early essay, that would provide a sufficient motivating basis for getting people interested in Indian philosophy. That somehow in this Indian context in the 20th century, you had to make that move for the enterprise of Indian philosophy to be a legitimate enterprise, right? And it's, it's, it's in, 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 in some senses that claim that I find surprising. Why do I find it surprising? And I would argue that actually that, end, that claim ended up being self-defeating uh, uh, in many ways is for the following reason, which is now in a certain sense, of course, the idea was absolutely right, right? You cannot reduce all Indian philosophy to a practical context, right? You cannot reduce it all. You cannot reduce studies of logic or philosophy of language or epistemology. You cannot always claim that they are in the service of a objective of practical reason, right? Some kind of unfolding of this larger self, which is going to sort of, you know, merge, merge in all. Dadji was certainly right about that. On the other hand, right, even those schools of thought that do not directly connect themselves, right, with this larger spiritual enterprise of trying to understand the self in relation to the world metaphysically as a whole, operate under the shadow of that aspiration of realizing that deeper and truer self. Right? And one of the things that I think that has happened to the study of Indian philosophy, and now I'll, I, I can't imitate Dayaji, so, you know, but um, I, 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 I'll try and be provocative in a way uh, in which he often was, which is that in his attempt to abstract out Indian philosophy from this larger spirituality, he epitomized something like the following moment. And, and the way to think about it is, think of a thought experiment. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's an often quoted uh, uh, thought experiment that Alistair McIntyre uh, uh, proposes in the beginning of After Virtue. And he makes this point about our moral language, right? And part of the argument he's making is that our moral language is a remnant, or Western moral language is a remnant of a kind of Christian ethic and once that Christian ethic erodes, 
what we are doing is in a sense operating with fragments of meaning that derive their sense from that ethic, but which we can't put together as a coherent whole. But think of a very different kind of experiment. Suppose the following were to happen, right? Suppose for some reason we got rid of all the practices of science. Right? There's an anti-science movement, we smash up the laboratories, we burn up scientific textbooks. Right? All that is left with us is certain texts and books of philosophy of science. Right? And imagine, maybe a couple of centuries later, people trying to reconstruct what this practice was from the remnants of these textbooks on the philosophy of science. Right? So you have different schools, different schools of interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, you know, which are in a sense philosophical disputes over the status of quantum mechanics. Or they are philosophical disputes over the status of what physical laws might actually mean. Are they simply mathematical formalities? Are they, do they actually describe the real nature of the universe? Right? What would our description of scientific practice look like? You could actually do a lot of clever things with these texts. You could write histories that says there are these three schools in the philosophy of science. There is a certain kind of internal coherence to, to a particular school, right? But could you actually reconstruct what the practices these texts are referring to? Right? From, as it were, these second order, these better level texts. Now, one thing that has happened, and I, I'll, I'll say this from the ground of ignorance as an amateur, I think the crisis in the study of Indian philosophy, right, both as an academic discipline, but you might say as a larger cultural phenomenon, I think came precisely from a kind of analogous catastrophe, where what you have is texts of different schools, right? Nyaya, Sheshek, Charvak, all kinds of textual traditions, right? You can even put Tantric or Ghoric texts in, 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 in this. These are available to us as texts, right? What we don't have a sense of, right, is what were the stakes, right, in these disputes that these texts are actually fighting. Now, in some areas, we can see the stakes very clearly. And it's not an accident that the most fertile ground for doing Indian philosophy in the 20th century has been philosophy of language and logic. right? Because in a sense, you can see when logicians are arguing uh, you know, about the nature and status of logic, you know what the common ground between them is, which they are in a sense trying to interpret or, or extend. But on almost every other aspect, that matters to philosophy, right? Causation, the nature of the self, right? The nature of ultimate reality. If, if, if you think of philosophy as being a kind of descriptive metaphysics about the world, on any of these questions that actually motivated this enterprise, right? This, this spiritual enterprise, as is, 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 is in a sense I call it, we have absolutely no sense of what these practices are referring to. Right? And this problem crops up almost every in every sphere of Indian philosophy that you can actually think of. What does it mean to read Shankar or meditate on the nature of the Brahman without actually understanding anything about Shankar's yogic practices? Right? Which is a set of practices that they thought gave access to that breathes life into this metaphysical description that they are presenting as philosophical argument. What does it mean to re read Abhinav Gut, right? <laughs> Frankly, without having any sense of that tantric luminosity that he's actually talking about, which his formal texts are giving a metaphysical description of, right? We can go even one step further. Um, you know, been re reading recently a lot of literature on Kabir, you know, the perpetual kind of object of contention uh, in, in interpretations of modern poetry. Uh, 
And whether you read the literature in Hindi or in English, right? There's a recent book by Milind Vakanka, for example, on Kabir's ontology. I'm frankly just completely puzzled by this literature. I'm completely puzzled by this literature because all this literature will, for example, make constant reference to the Nath Sampradaya, right? Kabir's Ulad Basi is his, his, his complicated relationship to the Nath Sampradaya, right? Can we even begin to make sense of what that relationship is about? without having some imputive grasp of what that practice of the Nath Sampradaya would have been like. What we have is the words. What we have is the text that makes sense. right? In some sense of the term making sense. But we have lost any sense of that reference. The practices in a sense that breathes life into these texts. Right? We are exactly like the philosopher of science, you know, reading those philosophy of science texts without having understand, any understanding of what is the practice that these texts are referring to, right? right? When you read anything about consciousness, what is, it, what is the state of being that it is actually referring to? Can you get access to it only in a sense through this metaphysical sort of description of it? Now, because in a sense we wanted to abstract philosophy in a sense from that context of practice, it has led to a couple of unfortunate consequences. The first unfortunate consequence it has led to is, once you are talking about a meta-level debate, which has no reference to this common ground of practice, by definition there is nothing that can mediate this argument. Right? So think of two descriptions of the philosophy of science. One description that just reads the philosophy of science text and says, oh my god, there are these schools, they disagree. A has assumption A, B, and C, B has assumption X, Y, and Z, you know, and then we kind of just work out what the logic of these assumptions is. But underlying that difference, actually the common ground is they both claim to be talking about certain forms of practice, right? On which they actually agree more. They, they agree on the legitimacy of science. They agree on the legitimacy of scientific method. They agree on, it, on, in a sense, if you like, the status of the conclusion that science brings. They disagree on how you might actually interpret it. Right? So what happened to Indian philosophy in some senses? Right? What happened to Indian philosophy was that instead of a genuine philosophical enterprise, because the presupposition of any argument is that there must be some reality that in principle could mediate that argument. Right? If there's no such reality, the argument will go around in circles. Right? There's nothing that could lead me to convince you to think otherwise, because there is actually no common reference, which is the external yardstick by which we, in a sense, measure the quality of arguments. I mean, I often joke, you know, and it's often said, Bhikkhu Parikh has said it, that uh, only Indians can take the epithet argumentative Indian as a, uh, as a, as a claim, as a, of, as, as a compliment. Because argumentative means somebody who goes on arguing even after the matter has been settled. <laughs> or to put it differently, argumentative means somebody who goes on arguing where there is nothing that could actually settle the argument. Right? Now, in a way, that's exactly what happened to Indian philosophy. Right? Uh, not just its kind of dispersal into schools, but in the 20th century, even the schools became, even the interpretation of the interpretation remained, you know, became three steps removed, right? So there's a kind of rehearsive quality to it uh, in, 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 you know, in, 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 in some deep, uh, uh, in some deep way. Because there's no sense of what the practice it is that it's referring to. And I think this point becomes very important because, uh, and I'll just give sort of two, two examples to illustrate what I mean. Uh, even as late as the 1930s, 1940s, um, uh, and I'll just pick a random example. It's, it's an extraordinary book to read. Um, uh, Acharya Narendra Dev wrote uh, a massive book in Hindi on Bodhar and Darshan. It's about 500 pages. Absolutely brilliant. But what's worth its weight in that gold, uh, in, in gold, uh, uh, in that book, is also an introduction, a 50-page introduction by Gopinath Kaviraj. 
to the book. And, and obviously, Gopinath Kaviraj had a very different perspective on, 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 on what they are writing. But Gopinath Kaviraj very powerfully makes this point there, right? That if, as a non Buddhist, understood in a denominational sense, what it means philosophically is a much more complicated question beyond what is a denominational sense. He can engage with Acharya Narendra Dev's text and his reconstruction of Buddhist philosophy is because they actually share a common ground of yogic practice. They even share certain assumptions about what reality that my practice might actually give access to. And then, from then on, all kinds of disagreements follow about what the status of, in a sense, this experience is. Right? But the fact of the matter is, you could actually, in a sense, have that dialogue, right? In a way that still made the pretense, or I, I, sorry, I should rephrase, it didn't make the pretense, but it still presupposed that the enterprise that these different schools were engaged in had this common ground, an external referent, an external reality that could mediate the argument between the two. Right? And the question to ask is when did that sense completely vanish in, in Indian right, philosophy? And I have been suggesting to you that part of the reason why it vanished right, is because, in a sense, the context of practice within which that philosophy made sense, right, completely vanished. Okay. Now, I, I don't want to sort of go 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 on too long, but I I, I do want to sort of uh, uh, make kind of two other general points, and then bringing back to Dayaji's kind of affirmative, uh, thing, which is, you know, Dayaji was interesting in the sense that I. I you know, he would not probably describe himself as spiritually musical in any sense. I don't think there's any, any. you know, I, th I think he would be loath at, at, at that description. Yet, if you actually read, uh, particularly the prolegomena uh, to, to a future study of civilizations, um, there is a kind of interesting moment, uh, moment there where uh, he kind of concedes what the point of a kind of spiritual approach might be. And, and he explains it kind of very prosaic terms, which is he begins to acknowledge the fact that even when we desire ordinary material things, no finite thing is desirable in itself. What we find desirable, right, must correspond to some prior conception in light of which that thing is desirable, right? So I say this object is beautiful, I desire this beautiful object. It becomes a beautiful object in light of some prior conception of beauty that I'm bringing to bear on it, right? And just this very prosaic fact, which is true of all our apprehension of, 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 of material reality, right? That in a sense, as Rajiv has written once somewhere, that you know all reality makes sense only under a particular description of it, right? The very fact that you are compelled to make this description, actually already always puts you into a spiritual realm. Why does it put you into a spiritual realm? Because it commits you to a form of abstraction, number one, right? Uh, it commits you to finding a ground in light of which the so-called material reality makes sense, right? It's in a sense, if you like, the soul that is actually illuminating the body rather than the body being independent or in a sense of, of you know, in the sense of the soul. So Dayaji himself had these kind of occasionally fleeting moments of recognition. But it's not a line that I think his Vichar Vinod's temperament actually allowed him to allowed him to kind of pursue uh, fully. And if you think about philosophy's relation to the world this way, then there is a sense in which the structure of consciousness that you bring to the world has to be inherently ecstatic and joyful. It has to be inherently ecstatic and joyful in the sense that the act of taking the world seriously right, presupposes the idea in some ways that our world can correspond to the world, that the structure of consciousness and the structure of our rationality right, 
actually bring, brings forth truths that exist independently of it, that you know, in a sense act as a truth. Otherwise, it will descend in pure, pure, pure subjectivism. Right? So then he had this moment, and he didn't quite pursue it. And, and I think he did pursue it partly because of this overweening fear, right? That you did not want to get back into the accusation that Indian philosophy is spiritual, right? Uh, but in, 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 and in that sense, he kind of lost, uh, I, think, I think, an opportunity. What I want to end with is to pose one very large cultural question about the Ajit enterprise. And in a sense, I think given there's so many distinguished writers here, uh, 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 you know, I think uh, I'd love to hear, hear the comments of it. <coughs> uh, and this question uh, came to me, I think, most profoundly once reading an essay, 1938 essay from Azali Prasad Vedi. Uh, and it's a very moving essay. Uh, part of it is a kind of meditation on, you know, what has been the fate of Indian culture? Why is nobody interested in it? And part of the argument uh, Vedi ji gives is an argument common to the times that when you see the degeneracy of society around you, right, can you actually believe in the glory of this tradition whatsoever? I mean, there's, there's something morally irresponsible about even beginning to acknowledge the glory of that tradition, right? Um, I mean, it's very graphic descriptions, you know, Kalidaski Sansat Santan Hin Bech Rehi Eto Kalidas Kese Samajayega. And he goes through then various moves, you know, trying to explain what what might be worth retrieving that tradition. But he constantly comes back to this theme. Over and over again, with extraordinary pathos. Right? Shastra Charcha Right? And that moment of cultural crisis, right, in a sense, I think I think more than the fact that as Dayaji's diagnosis was that what went wrong with Indian philosophy was people started calling it spiritual, right? Dvediji's diagnosis was in a sense completely the opposite. That no matter what you call it, right? No matter what your understanding of the richness of this tradition is, right? At some fundamental level we had reached as a society a cultural point, right? Where you know, interest in the Shastra, and Shastra is understood in the broader sense, not just kind of old texts, right? Shastra Charcha Me Kis Kuruchi Hai, right? And it's a very Nietzschean question. It's a very Nietzschean question, and, 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 and because Dayaji was a skeptic, I think this reference is appropriate. It's a very Nietzschean question in the sense that when Nietzsche talked about the death of God, right, uh, it wasn't the literal death of religion. I mean, that, that's an old story in, in, in Western metaphysics. He was asking a deeper question. He was not denying truth, right? Never denied it, but the truth can have its uses. But he was trying to place you in a cultural circumstance <coughs> where moral psychologically you might you begin to even question the value of truth. Right? You're not questioning the status of truth, you're not questioning the existence of truth. It's almost like, can a culture reach a point where you say, I know this is true, but I don't care, right? What would happen to a culture where truth ceased to motivate you, right? And Nietzsche's great achievement as a kind of moral psychologist, right, was to, in a sense, break the internal connection between truth, goodness, beauty, whatever you want to call it, and subjective motivation, right? Most philosophies operate on this assumption that once you have explained, right, truth, goodness, beauty, you come to fully understand it. It has the intrinsic properties to motivate. Agar sach aapko samaj aagya, to aap sach ke raha pe chalenge, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of the moral version of it, right? But, but you can think of it in the context of aesthetics as well, right? Nietzsche's radicalism was to completely, as it were, dissociate the question of motivation from the question of any other metaphysical game about it. Right? In rereading Indian intellectual history, partly prompted by the Ajit, what is striking to me is how pervasive that Nietzschean moment is in Indian intellectual history as well. And I'll, I'll just end with two examples. 
uh, uh, to illustrate what I mean and, 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 and perhaps articulate what deeply this crisis means. Take two very important figures to modern Indian intellectual history, uh, Muhammad Iqbal uh, and Sri Aurobindo. At one level you might say very different traditions, uh, extraordinarily different sensibilities, uh, both political, religious. But if you read both of them carefully, right, uh, one of the things that's striking is how much they thought that one thing common to both of them is that any modern Indian, Indian, I'm using the term loosely in, in, in some ways, I mean, neither of them use the term Indian to describe themselves in this context. But any philosophical enterprise would have to come to terms with the legacy of Nietzsche. Uh, reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, which is one of the most extraordinary books written in 20th century uh, India, although it's, 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 it's politically frightening in some parts as well, uh, particularly when you read the passage and the passages in the uh, 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 you know, Ahmadiyas. Uh, on the one hand, and Aurobindo's cycle of uh, human unity on the other. Uh, I think the only Western philosopher to whom Aurobindo actually gives probably the ultimate praise right, by way of you know, uh, uh, sort of cryptic references that are absolutely spot on, spot on is Nietzsche. And what they both have in common is the starting point that even India and the traditions that they belong to have actually reached a point of Nietzschean subjectivism. What they mean by Nietzschean subjectivism is the following. One, that the traditions that have in a sense nourished intellectual inquiry, both within Islam, in Arbindo's case, within you know, Hinduism, whatever you want to call it. Those traditions are dead traditions in one very specific sense. Not in the sense that there you know, aren't intellectuals arguing about it and so forth. But they are dead in the sense that even if their arguments are correct, right, even if they have this power, this philosophical power, they no longer have the power to motivate anybody. Right? So they are dead in a kind of factual cultural sense. Right? And the task of the religious reconstruction of Islam is in a sense to kind of work through this moment, to recover Islam kind of through this age of subjectivism. Right? And of course he uses Bergson a lot in, 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 in that enterprise. Aurobindo exactly the same moment. Right? In fact, Arbindo is much more elaborate on this, where he very self-consciously identifies this is the age of subjectivism. It is the age of individuality. Again, a term both Iqbal and Arbindo use consistently. Right? There is one part of individuality they like, which is individuality's association with freedom. But the challenge that individuality then poses right, is this radical Nietzschean challenge of what individuality means, right, and, and this radical interpretation of subjectivism is that nothing has the power to intrinsically motivate. You know, Nietzsche famously said at one level that if you believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4, even that is an act of unfreedom, right? <laughs> Logic is coercive by its nature, right? The point is not the philosophical play. That, that's much more complicated. The point both of them was making was that in relation to these philosophical traditions, the philosophical traditions of Islam and Islam, Indian society had also come to that relationship. So in that sense, Shastra Charcha Bhatya Bhatya Kisi Ko Ruchi Nahi I mean this, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost that, that kind of, so both of them had in a sense this, uh, this in common. Uh, of course they both had an explanation of it, which was also strictly parallel, which you know, Dvediji also gave that part of what had produced right, this distance, this motivational distance from these traditions was of course the sense of degeneracy that you saw all, all around you, right? Iqbal begins with this idea, right, of in a sense the decadence and by decadence, decadence he simply means being colonized, right, being taken over by something powerful uh, uh, of colonialism. Aurobindo also, in a sense, begins with that consideration, and almost all of Indian intellectual history, right? 
at one level or the other has to confront that psychological trauma of colonialism, right? That it's not just a psychological trauma in a political sense, right? But it, what it is, it's what it has done to our moral psychology. Right? That somehow the very thing whose effects we are as cultural and spiritual beings, that very thing comes to be held responsible for our degeneracy. And the diagnosis both of them make is interesting, contra diages, is that the solution to this is not going to be rational philosophical argument. It's not a matter of going to people as Dayaji said, make your heritage your task, right? Which is exactly what everybody these days tries to do, you know, read Indian philosophy, right? Yeah, I mean, try that in Indian universities, try that in a wider cultural setting that unless a community acquires some form of power, right, it cannot be prepared and be ready to engage with this level of spirit. And so he almost naturalizes nationalism that, you know, it's a kind of inevitable stage in history. Iqbal, the same thing, right? And, and in a sense, the central contradiction in Iqbal, arguably the central contradiction in, in Pakistan's objective revolution, right? that you're looking in both directions once. On the one hand, you're trying to say, there is this realm of the spirit, I mean, I'm using it loosely philosophically, right? that is in a sense available to you, but the only vehicle you, through which you can psychologically access it is by actually participating in a community that has acquired power over its own destiny. Again, that's a very sort of Nietzschean thought at, at, at you, know, you know, in a sense, at, 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 at one level. So my question, in a sense, and, or, 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 or in a sense, if Dayaji were around, you know, now would be to ask, which is twofold, which is, A, was Dayaji's anxiety about the reasons why people don't take Indian philosophy seriously, in the, in the sense he meant it, was that a kind of misdiagnosis? Right. Uh, was it, if you like, much more of a kind of academic philosopher's take on what was actually a larger cultural crisis, right, uh, 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 at one level? And second, I think, which is that if you have to find a path of recovery to that, and I'm not saying it's an obligatory recovery, if you are to make this heritage our task, as it were, what will be the motivational story under? Unfortunately, the only motivational story that has remained available to us now is nationalism. Do it because it's yours. Do it because it's Indian. Which, of course, there, as Dayaji and Arbindo and Iqbal would have been the first to say is completely the wrong reason, the external reason to go into it. But if that is not the external, that reason is philosophically illegitimate and politically dangerous. Right? What is the pathway back into, in a sense, that heritage? And did Dayaji close off that pathway and the, and, the, and the trajectory academic philosophy took by being actually too embarrassed to acknowledge what was the central question to that pathway, which is actually an interest in the relationship between the self and the world. Well, there's some time for either questions or Brief comments. Brief meaning really brief. Yeah. And if we could take the mic, just sir. And please speak your name. I am B. Jha from Surat. I am not even closely related to philosophy. I come from the state discipline. But in your version, the one thing that I have in my heart is this. कि भारतीय दर्शन में ये कहा गया कि मूलतः ये स्पिरिचुअलिज्म है और मैटेरियलिज्म को नेगलेक्ट किया गया है इस संबंध में जहाँ तक मेरा थोड़ा बहुत अध्ययन है मैंने अक्सर धर्म शास्त्रों में और ऐसी किताबों में पाया कि संतोष पर ज्यादा दिया गया अधिक धन कमाओ इस पर जोर नहीं दिया गया संतोष आ मृत तिप्ता हमेशा कहा गया संतोष करो धन कमाना क्या है और जब आधुनिक लेफ्टिस्ट फिलोसफी आया 
तुम उस गरीब को जो समझाया गया था कि ये गरीबी तुम्हारी फेटे है ईश्वर ने तुमको गरीब बनाया उसको इस समाज ने कहा इस लेफ्टिस फिलोसफी ने क्या कहा कि नहीं इट रॉन्ग डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी अदरवाइज गॉड नेवर वॉन्टेड यू टू बी पुअर तो इस दोनों को जरा सामंजस्य करने के लिए पाठ है धन्यवाद आपने बहुत बहुत बड़ा बहुत बड़ा प्रश्न पूछा है दो तरह से इस 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 सवाल का उत्तर देने की कोशिश करूंगा एक तो ये आप देखिए अगर कोई भी दर्शन है ये खाली भारतीय दर्शन की बात नहीं है किसी दर्शन में किसी दर्शन में पाश्चात्य दर्शन में भी भले वो उदारवादी दर्शन भी हो आधुनिक उदारवाद दर्शन भी हो आपको शायद ही कोई ऐसा दार्शनिक मिलेगा जो धन को धन को जीवन का सबसे बड़ा उद्देश्य कहने का साहस करेगा एक आधा आयन रहने का कोई मिल जाएगा लेकिन कोई कोई ऐसा दार्शनिक नहीं है जो 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 इस बात पर बोल देगा कि 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 धन अर्जन जीवन का सबसे बड़ा उद्देश्य है ये 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 तो ये 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 खाली समस्या हमारी नहीं है और अब अब एक तरह से सोचे तो ये 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 पाश्चात्य दर्शन की भी समस्या है और 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 हिस्टोरिकल मटेरियल्स का एक तरह से कहना सही है कि कैपिटलिज्म की जो समस्या है कि एक ये इकोनॉमिक सिस्टम ऐसा है इसमें एंडलेस एक्यूमुलेशन की बात इसकी लॉजिक ही एंडलेस एक्यूमुलेशन है फिलोसफी और दर्शन इससे जूझ नहीं पाए हैं ये तो ये तो ये तो ये जो समस्या है ये ये तो एक कॉमन एक तरह से कह सकते हैं समस्या और 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 हमारे भी जो चिंतक है बीसवीं सदी के सब ने यही माना उन्होंने जो 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 उनका कॉमन ग्राउंड था पाश्चात्य दर्शन तो वैसी विषय पे था तो ये तो बहुत 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 आपने इतना मौलिक प्रश्न उठाया है कि अगर इस समस्त इस इस प्रश्न का अगर हमको समाधान मिल जाए तो 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 ये सब चर्चा एक तरह से व्यर्थ हो जाएगी लेकिन एक एक दूसरा पहलू है जो आपके प्रश्न का और 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 वो जो मैंने जो बात कही उस 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 संदर्भ में बहुत प्रासंगिक है वो ये है कि अगर आप इकबाल को भी देखें और श्री अरबिंदो को भी देखें एक तरह से उन दोनों में हालांकि उन दोनों में भी अपनी तरह से कह कह लीजिए अरबिंदो में तो क्या खासकर स्पष्ट रूप से एक तरह की योगिक साधना पे बल था इकबाल का उसके फंक्शनल इक्विवेलेंट पे एक तरह से बल था लेकिन ये भाव दोनों में जरूर था और हर आधुनिक भारतीय चिंतक में रहा है ये भले वो कितना ही आस्तिक हो कितना ही श्रद्धा रखे ये भाव जरूर रहा है कि इस सभ्यता ने एक प्रश्न का सवाल नहीं दिया कि अगर आपको मोक्ष मिल जाए तो इससे दुनिया को क्या फायदा और ये प्रश्न बल कब पकड़ता है ये ये फिलोसॉफिकल क्वेश्चन है ये मॉरल साइकोलॉजिकल क्वेश्चन है किन परिस्थितियों में ये प्रश्न इतना प्रबल राजनीतिक रूप ले लेता है कि आज के भारत के संदर्भ में तो आप 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 ये कह सकते हैं कि कि समाज के बाहर सोशल के बाहर सोचने की भी का स्पेस नहीं है रिड्यूस्ड एवरीथिंग टू कि जब तक उसका कोई सामाजिक प्रयोजन ना हो तब तक इन प्रैक्टिस की कोई लेजिटिमेसी नहीं होगी कोई सभ्यता इस अवस्था में कैसे पहुंच जाए और 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 इसका एक तरह से कह सकते हैं एक तरह से इमेंसिपेटरी पोटेंशियल भी है इसका क्योंकि क्योंकि इसी सोच से ये एक सवाल उठा कि हमारी सामाजिक व्यवस्था को एक नेसेसिटी मान के क्यों दिया जाए जैसा आपने कहा लेकिन इस इंस्ट्रूमेंटलिज्म का एक दूसरा पहलू यह भी है कि सामाजिक उपयोगिता के बाहर कोई चीज ना सोची जाए और जो इंडियन फिलोसफी इंडियन कल्चर का सबसे बड़ा क्राइसिस है वो भी एक तरह का मटीरियलिज्म का परवर्टेड रूप है वो ये है कि जब तक आप उसकी सामाजिक उपयोगिता का पसंद नहीं दे सकते 
तब तक वो चीज जायज नहीं है अगर आप वो संदर्भ लेके कोई भी शास्त्र के पास जाते हैं तो तो पहली हार गए हम वो 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 किए तो इससे आपने बहुत बड़ा बड़ा प्रश्न उठाया है यही कह सकता हूँ Does the motivation of the class to make genuine sense of the meta text arise? You seem to suggest that it arises with the meta text. Now, if we look at uh, the making of the body, for instance, we can find something very interesting and something which uh, is quite the opposite of what you read out from the meta context. What we have in the West. Is a very determined, systematic erasure of the practice of an order uh, which has nothing really comparable here. I mean, that 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 is of an extraordinary order. In fact, the very foundation of the making of Christian is in being able to establish, consolidate, deepen that erasure. And yet, and not only that, but even the access to the meta text in the case of West is something of a much more fragmentary order than the other. Uh, and for example, uh, it is impossible to say how spoken Greek would have sounded in the time of Plato. Uh, you would not have that order of problem for some. And yet, uh, the engagement with the meta text is of a very powerful and deep order. That's all. That's a very, very large question. I think uh, you know I should come le- learn from you for a couple of days. Um, two quick responses, uh, and they'll certainly not be adequate, but uh, but hopefully, beginning of a conversation. Uh, <coughs> implicit in what I was saying, I think, was a claim, and, and I think this claim there, as you would probably have agreed with, uh, uh, of the following sort, which is: we have been brought up, brought up on this illusion of continuity. And access to practice, right? And 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 the example you use is a very telling one because that's the example often used, which is access to Sanskrit, right? We don't know what old Greek looked like. We know what Sanskrit looks like. There's an unbroken tradition, unbroken continuity, right? Just to take that example, I think we need to interrogate that claim uh, a lot more seriously, uh, and and interrogate in one one very specific sense. So. At one level, I agree with you, right? So, reading Plato is is difficult. Reading Plotinus would be difficult in the sense that uh, there is a large part of that structure of argument that is, of course, accessible to us through our practice. I mean, right? But the closer you get to Plato's metaphysics, right, the more we are exactly in that relation to recovery. I mean, that, the Timaeus, for example. Uh, almost nobody seems to really understand what's going on, in a sense, in that in you know in that in in that text or the or the or, or the large sections of the Aeneids, right? But let me put this provocative claim, uh, uh, you know, and be happy to challenge to this. Uh, when you pick up a text like the Rig Veda or Abhinu Gupta's writings on Tantra. We have access to the text. We have people who know Sanskrit, who seem to be able to read the text, understand it at one level deeply, write something about it. 
But don't you often get the sense that we have access to the words, the sense but not the reference? Has any any exposition of the Rig Veda? And I'll, 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 I'll be provocative in a Dayachi kind of way. I mean, this is evening time, IIC, so you'll remember. Has any exposition of the Rig Veda, you know, other than snippets here and there, a metaphorical reading of, uh, you know, th this, um, this passage, uh, an expressive reading, a symbolic reading of this and that, has any reading of the Rig Veda, does it make sense to any of us? No matter how deeply versed you are in Sanskrit. Okay. Even people who acknowledge the Veda, I mean, you know, authority, I mean, this is a serious question. This is a serious question. When you pick up a text like Tantra Lok, I mean, we, we do interesting things with it. You know, we take the two passages on consciousness and, 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 you know, draw all kinds of analogies and similar, you know. But is it, is it really accessible? So that's the sense. It's, it's not in the sense about access to the text, right? Uh, if you like, the words are accessible to us, but not the reality that those words were actually making, mm. right? In that sense, actually, I would argue that our position is, in a sense, the reverse uh, uh, of, of Christianity. Again, this is a very generalized uh, uh, argument, but uh, if you think about it, right? Uh, with Christianity, in, in a sense, if you like, almost the opposite happened. The almost the opposite happened in the sense that there is a powerful line of argument, Charles Taylor has made it, but many others have made it as well, is that even in those trying to flee its traces, right, trying to flee, you know, flee the hegemony of Christianity, how deeply those assumptions crop up. Right? We can read Kant and Hegel as secular thinkers. But Kant and Hegel are thinkers in the moment, in the evolution of Christianity, right? right? Or even John Rawls, actually, for that matter, right? As if you read his kind of early doctoral dissertation and then you see those assumptions running, right? Our break is much more deeper, right? And, and you could say it's the height of colonialism or whatever, right? Where actually in, in the West, even when you are denying that heritage, it is actually exercising its influence on you. In our case, even when we are actually claiming it, we cannot actually insert into in, into a lived reality, right? So, in a sense, I mean, if you, if you like, I'm, I'm sort of probably kind of turning your argument on, on its. In that sense, it's it's it, 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 it's actually you know different, and and I and I think it also plays out in cultural politics, right? I mean, in some senses, if you think about it in very prosaic ways. Uh, pointing out in an argument, let's say even in a Rawlsian argument about the inviolability of the individual and its, and its deep roots in a certain Protestant conception of the relationship between self and world, causes no embarrassment to that argument. It's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Right? Our cultural distance is signified by the fact that if you actually point it to any such continuity, immediately the argument would be disowned and so even at the level of institutional and cultural practice, I would argue that that, 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 that gulf is deeper. I, mean, I don't think Vivekanand was joking when he actually said that you know, it, was easy, it was going to be easier for him to do Vedanta in, the, in America than it, was going to, than it was for him to do it here. I don't think that was meant just as a flippant joke, actually. right? Uh, because that heritage has become a task in this sense. That's the sense of, of, of distance. Um, yeah, just <clears throat> in terms of practice not being available, one of the questions that is central in uh, Indian philosophy or in Indian spirituality is this notion of what is real, what is self, and it would seem to me that the practice is very much available because somewhere there was a, um, an understanding that one can observe oneself. 
and that observation at a certain level goes from being subjective to being objective. So this idea that you know the, the motivation for seeking an answer to that question or those questions of truth or beauty are founded in a practice that is still available and I was sort of troubled by your contention that there is a complete break between realization and motivation. Uh, is your question related? Maybe I can answer it somewhat. Okay, okay, maybe I'll, okay. Okay, uh, you talked about that people have stopped taking interest in Vedas and all that. My question is, uh, have we included this into our curriculum? Do we, uh, you know, uh, make our uh, children to think about that this is a tradition and, and to think about that the concept of contentment and then saying that Vivekananda once said that khali bed to bhajan bhi nahi hota. So taking this contentment and khali bed to bhajan bhi nahi hota. We can have a you know, hand in hand relationship with capitalism. capitalism. I appreciated the people yeah, 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 just they yeah. do very different questions. Yeah, yeah, they're very, 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 very different, different questions. So maybe just you can wait on that one. I, I, and let's engage. I'll just take this question. I'll come to this. I've got your question. I'll, I'll come to it. So, now thanks for that question. And, and uh, I think I should sort of mo mo modify or say that you would say. Every statement is conditional, and I haven't spent out the conditions under which what I've said um, uh, is true. Um, I think you're you're right. I mean, you're right in in the sense, if, if I understood you correctly, which is that uh, it's, it's it's certainly too sweeping claim to say that those practices are not not available. Right? Uh, uh, many would would dispute that, and I'm certainly in opposition to sort of you know doubt the veracity. I think what what I had in mind more was a was was the following thing, which is a of course that those those in a sense the only way to now understand those practices right are not as institutionally are not as practices uh, that can be in a sense the locus of shared argument and shared debate. Uh, those practices, if you like, have been subjectivized. Now, whether they're, I, I actually agree, agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I mean, this, this, this was the point Nietzsche and Abhinav were making. It was not about the, the, the correctness of the statement as a philosophical description. Obviously, uh, uh, in a sense, the motivation of those practices, and once you realize them, is to actually bring forth an objective reality. Otherwise, it would not make sense, right? But as a cultural phenomenon, their objectivity as a cultural fact is no longer available to us. Okay. So that's, which is a slightly different claim, which doesn't mean that there aren't people trying to do this. Which, so so that's, that's one modification. The second question which you raised, which is about this, this connection between, in a sense, motivation and, and, and a conception of the good. Uh, you or know, truth or, or, or truth or whatever. So, it, th there's a joke in philosophy classes. You know, there's basically three theories of motivation, and 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 once you figure out what your theory of motivation is, you can figure out everything else. One is, in a sense, what's called the erotic theory of motivation, right? Which is that there is some compelling external reality, which, if you apprehend it fully, would itself provide the corresponding motivation. So, if morality is an objective truth, you understand morality fully, that would itself generate a corresponding motivation. Or if you want a more platonic image, in a sense, if you understood the form and the beatitude of the form fully, it would provide the corresponding motivation, right? So, in a sense, it's a conception of motivation that is, if you like, driven by something that objectively exists independently of us, right? That's, I'm putting it crudely. There's a second theory of motivation that you might say is more autoerotic, right? I mean, that's in a sense the kind of the post Kantian where there's nothing in a sense about the structure of the world existing independently of us that provides actually motivational pull on us. 
The only motivational pull that disciplines us is something, in a sense, internal to our own willing, right? That somehow our self itself has a rational structure, right? That gives it some shape and form and provides some motivation, right? Uh, and the third, in a sense, is if you like a more sort of radical kind of autonomy, which is that, if you like, it's just more random, right? What the, which is that the only account of motivation you can give is a psychological, historical, cultural, contingent account of motivation, right? Not one that actually, in a sense, closely connects motivation to the particular object in which it, in a sense, fastens, right? Now, I actually happen to be, I mean, to so kind of reveal, as the AG would say, you know, reveal your presumption. I'm actually much more sympathetic to the platonic view. I, I actually don't think motivation makes sense unless, in a sense, it's compelled by some governing idea of a truth that exists independently of you, or if you want to articulate in any terms of this kind of reality that underlies the self, which actually has an objective character, right? But I have to accept the fact, and, and, and this one I probably will defend more, that there are actually very few takers culturally of that idea of motivation. I think we are more in, in a sense, the third realm. And what's interesting to me is even those thinkers who, in a sense, are closest to that, right, Aurobindo, Iqbal, Azali Prasad, Dvedi, who still have some sense of all of that, right, how deeply they acknowledge and are troubled by the fact that this motivational problem will require a, almost a kind of psycho-historical diagnostic, not a conceptual and philosophical. Uh, that, I think, is a large cultural fact about it. Quickly answer to your question. Uh, look, uh, you know, we can have an argument about what should be taught and whatnot. And certainly, you know, I mean, I'll say, it, you know, provocatively, Indian universities and schools have a massive crisis of curriculum in general. It's not specific to Indian materials. It's, 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 it's the way we design our curriculums is... Is, is just so extraordinarily irresponsible from a pedagogical point of view. There's nothing to do with pedagogically, particularly in humanities and, and most of social sciences, with the possible exception of economics. Right? Nothing to do with pedagogy. Um, uh, uh, you know, Rajiv has tried valiantly here and there to make make some changes, but by and large, so there's a larger debate to be had about what, in a sense, an appropriate curriculum is going to be. But I will I will say two things. Um, partly I'll say this to provoke Ashokji because there are a lot of you know people who, uh, who the drawings of Hindi literature in this room. Uh, if you take the Hindi syllabus of CBSE, right? I don't know any of you have children here, school going age, you know ICSEC. I guarantee you that syllabus is the surest way of turning off any kid from Hindi. Okay? Just a simple anthropological hand count, right? Okay. A, because it's not clear whether it's a reform, it's a syllabus about social reform or whether it's a syllabus about the Hindi language. Every single item in a Hindi book is about a 19th century tale of social reform. You're not going to get a kid. I mean, they just don't understand the possibilities of this language, right? I mean, Hindi equals morbid social reform, some pious social reformers, end of story, right? I mean, frankly, the only way to teach Hindi now is, you know, assign the Hindi translation of Harry Potter. It's a beautiful translation, incredibly fun. It will tell you what you can do with language if you take it out of the Scythe Academy, right? So there's a larger debate to be had about, about this, right? But, but the question of the Vedas that you raised is even more important. Seriously, find me five people who can teach the Vedas. This, this question I'm not going to back off from. Okay? Forget kids. There aren't five serious scholars who can read the text and make sense of it. So the only thing that will happen in assigning that text is not that you are actually giving pedagogical tools of inquiry into something profound, right? Is it will be either an unintelligible <coughs> instrument that you know kids will read and then discard, right? Right. In fact, the surest way of getting get, getting them off something is to actually assign it to them, right? But 
I think there is, I mean, you know, I think there is this larger uh, issue about what's in mean, my, I'll, I'll just sort of end with this, I know it's getting late, but my take on the Ramanujan controversy, for example, in Delhi University, right, I'll just use this as an example of what's wrong with the way we think about it. One, of course, what's wrong with it is why should a top university have so much invested in a predefined syllabus, right? And it has to do with the nature of our exam system. So it's an all or nothing affair. If you don't get on to those three list articles that are prescribed, you, you're nowhere, right? So, so there's, a, there's an institutional stake in that. But if we were fair about it, right, and, and everybody defended, you know, arguments back and forth, Hindutva versus diversity, Nobody talked about the pedagogical argument. You are assigning Ramanujan, it's, it's one of my favorite essays, okay? But you are assigning it to undergraduates who, have, who will neither read the Ramayana or have read it, any version of it, any text version of it, other than Amar Chitkatha, which is a great one, nor have read any Freud, which is, which is very central to Ramanujan's interpretation and the creativity of that text, right? So what is the pedagogical structure in which that text is being inserted, right? It's, it's exactly the same thing I told you, which is either way on both sides, the use of that text is an extrinsic use. Somebody wants to use it as a flag bearer or, or diversity, somebody wants to clamp it down as a flag bearer or something else, right? But there is no pedagogical articulation of, of the function of that. That's the debate we need to have over syllabus. It's not about Vedas or, 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 or you know, particular texts. Small question to ask. I think if I understood you a bit. You have a uh, question the utilitarian aspect of moksha, uh, and uh, it has no use perhaps in the society, and perhaps Indian philosophy has not explained. For uh, since time immemorial, people have been seeking for it, including common and uh, sent people, and uh, also we see at the present time that a uh, thousand and thousand people are coming to Varanasi in order to have moksha and they spend their life and wish to end their life there. So I want some, uh, I mean, are they stupid that they are following, what is the use of, uh, I mean, uh, moksha for them? So exactly I would like to know. Well, you have your answer then. I, I'm certainly not in a position to answer that question. Um, but, but, but again, you know, it's a sense of claim about, look, any culture, and this is not just true of India, by the way, I, do, I don't buy this contrast, you know, any culture in any place there are human beings, there are dissonances in our human condition, right? And in a sense, one of the impulses to metaphysics, to moral philosophy is to try and overcome those dissonances, or at least make sense of them, right? And that will take many forms. It will take an intellectual form, it may take a personal spiritual form. Um, there's, you know, a nice line from that uh, Gopinath Kaviraj, introdu uh, Kaviraj introdu introduction I referred to, where he says, look, I don't find these distinctions people make between bhakti and jnana and all of that very tangible. At one level, the underlying motivation is is, 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 is in a yogic sense, he says, you know, gyan ki drishti se brahm dhoon rahe hain, yog ki drishti se parmatma dhoon rahe hain, aur bhakti ki drishti se bhavan dhoon rahe hain. Right? Uh, so, these, that impulse, in a sense, will, 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 will be pervasive, right? What has changed? And, and in no society, never in Indian society did everybody, you know, anybody assume that you know, moksha would be an actually active ideal for other, you know, uh, anyone except maybe a very small school, school of select and lucky people and even there we are not sure, right? But a whole cultural and philosophical ethos was framed in the context of that Swanta Sukhaya aspiration, right? Or Satchinadant, right? 
some conception of the self that could or that that could where in a sense being and this coincide right it's the f- people are seeking that i mean that's your question is analogous to the question of practice i'm not saying that 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 that, that doesn't it kind of exist but there is no in a sense intellectual or shared cultural frame within which not to understand that enterprise it's been purely privatized and subjectivized right as your freedom as citizens aapko banaras jana hai aapko you know zyada khane mein milti hai kari right but its centrality to actually defining a philosophical canvas right or uh, its centrality to elaborating the structure of metaphysical argument that's all gone right and with that going Uh, you know dayaji had this hope that you you sort of take that out you will say but look there's all this other stuff in indian philosophy right and in a sense my claim is once that goes out why why would you care about this other stuff right that's uh, dr basbe i have not a question but i want to make it tipping hum mithilanchal area bihar se aate hain to wahan par sanskrit bhasha ki badi bhari pad pati hai और बारात में भी लड़की वाले की तरफ से पंडित होते हैं लड़का वाले के, के तरफ से पंडित होते हैं और वहाँ कहा जाता है पंडित अंग पंडित अंग विश्वासवान बदबू आए एक पंडित दूसरे को देखे तो दर्शन शास्त्र में एक चीज डॉक्टर मेहता आपको मैं कह रहा हूँ कैसे दीवारों का निर्णय होता है कहीं भी हमारे एरिया की बात सुन लीजिए वो कहते हैं दर्शन शास्त्री चाहे विद्वान ज्यादा हो चाहे कम हो थोड़ा मोटा तगड़ा हो ना मानोगे वेल फ्रेंड्स आई थिंक यू विल एग्री दैट this has been a very brilliant lecture a very provocative and i think that krishna would have liked it immensely because this is the true that krishna spirit in which as he said in the beginning he is going to use that krishna against himself uh, that's that's a, uh, a dangerous uh, enterprise and it can it can go either way but i must say that uh, so mehta has done a brilliant job and i think he has raised many questions uh, but since he mentioned about the hindi syllabus uh, let me tell you a story mere sasur nemichandr jain hindi ke bade lekhak the aur meri saas rekha jain bhi hindi mein bahut kaam karti thi ek din unhone mujhe phone kiya bole ashok ki hamari natim se zara baat karo ye hindi nahi padhna chahti school mein और ये यहाँ के सबसे अच्छे स्कूलों में पढ़ती थी सरदार पटेल विद्यालय तो मैंने उससे पूछा कि भाई क्यों तुम तो हिंदी क्यों नहीं पढ़ना चाहती और ये बड़ी उपदेशात्मक भाषा है <laughs> तो मैंने क्या मतलब कि उसमें यही बताया जाता है कि क्या करना चाहिए क्या करना चाहिए <laughs> तो ये सही है और मैं अब मेरा पोता उसी स्कूल में पढ़ता है उसकी हिंदी खासी अच्छी है लेकिन उसको वहां की अध्यापिकाएं बिगाड़ने पर उतारू हैं जैसे अर्धचंद्र वो हंसने पर अर्धचंद्र लगाता है तो उसकी अध्यापिका कहती कि नहीं इसमें तो बिंदी लगाओ अर्धचंद्र की क्या जरूरत है अब वो बेचारा अपनी अध्यापिका से नहीं कह सकता कि आप ये गलत कह रही हैं तो हिंदी की हिंदी में मेरा ख्याल से हिंदी के तीन बड़े दुश्मन है और भी होंगे शायद ज्यादा लेकिन तीन तो कम से कम है ही भाषा अधिकारी उन सब को फौरन बर्खास्त कर देना चाहिए ये जो अभी यूपीएससी में झगड़ा हो रहा है ये उसी के नतीजे हैं जो आप अर्थ नहीं लगा सकते कि क्या हम नहीं लगा सकते बेचारे अभी बी ए में पास किया लड़का कैसे लगाएगा एक दूसरी हिंदी अध्यापक अधिकांशतः अध्यापिका वो भी हिंदी को बिगाड़ने में और ऐसी भाषा सिखा रही हैं जिसे इस भाषा में रस संभव ही नहीं है जैसे इस भाषा में मजा आ ही नहीं सकता और ये विचित्र एक वो बन गया है 
मैंने मध्य प्रदेश में टेक्स्ट बुक्स का एक पुनराविष्कार करने की एक विफल चेष्टा की थी उस दौरान 400 स्कूलों में नई पाठ्य पुस्तकें आजमाइश के तौर पर चलाई गई और फिर अध्यापकों की प्रतिक्रियाएं ली गई ये आठवीं क्लास तक की पुस्तकें थी एक आया कि प्रेमचंद के बड़े भाई साहब को इसलिए नहीं रखना चाहिए कि बच्चों को रिश्वत के बारे में बताती महादेवी वर्मा की कविता भारतीय संस्कृति के बुनियादी मूल्यों के विरुद्ध है जाकिर हुसैन का एक पाठ अबू खा की बकरी इसलिए हटा देना चाहिए क्योंकि उससे कोई शिक्षा नहीं मिलती और नजीर अकबर आबादी की कविता क्या क्या नाच दिखाती है रोटियां इसलिए हटा देना चाहिए कि वो भारत भारतीय मूल्य परंपरा के विरुद्ध है भौतिकवादी संस्कृति का प्रचार करती अब ये अध्यापकों की जो प्रतिक्रिया थी और सरकारी स्कूल के अध्यापक थे तो आप सोच सकते हैं कि हम आप किस गहरे संकट में हैं बहरहाल कि इस, इस पर अभी विचार अलग से किया जाएगा हम आप सबके बहुत आभारी हैं रजा फाउंडेशन की ओर से और अपनी ओर से कि आप सब यहाँ आए और डॉक्टर मेहता के कि उन्होंने इतना निर्भीक इतना उत्तेजक व्याख्यान दिया जो दया कृष्ण की आत्मा के बहुत निकट रहा धन्यवाद